you, uh, Vini, for organizing this event. I, I do feel it's a challenging uh, event. Uh, when we talked about it, uh, we discussed that it's important to have uh, a voice from a different tradition. It's very important to have a voice, and it's important to have dialogue, and it's important to have uh, healthy disagreement also, and do it in a nice way. And I'm very glad and grateful that we need to organize this event. And also Shika for her leadership in organizing and mobilizing uh, you know, the whole community to, for this event. She's a student at Princeton University. And want to thank all of you for taking the time on a busy uh, work night to come for this. I want to start by saying that the book, which I hope you get a copy of, uh, is not a book that is promoting a religion or knocking down a religion. It is certainly not a book advocating Hinduism by any means, and it is not a book that is uh, attacking Christianity uh, by any means. It's a book that is looking at India as a nation, a collection of a large diversity of people of all the faiths possible, and many kinds of diversity, and the risks they face uh, from certain kinds of external threats. Now, these are not the only threats that Indians face. They face many problems. There's economic problems. There's water shortage problems. And you can, you can just make a whole list of things. But the project of this book selected out of the whole range of problems being faced that threaten the security, integrity, sovereignty of India, and unity of India, selected those problems that start from a foreign nexus the foreign nexus being located outside, and, it, and we focused on the one in the West, because I live here and I understand that dynamics. Uh, so US-based and European-based nexus of forces that are posing a kind of threat, which is not uh, the kind of threat people normally study and normally notice. Normally people notice you know, there's a military threat, there's a nuclear threat from somebody or whatever, and the last thing many of the media wants to talk about is that a different kind of threat comes from the West, and that has to do with appropriating Indian minorities uh, in the name of saving them or in the name of converting them or giving them human rights, but actually in a way that changes their identity, their, their uh, sense of history, sometimes very fabricated ideas of history, uh, gives them a sense of victimhood, that they are victims of the nation, and it, it has the effect over a period of time of uh, tension and that tension can erupt into violence. So there's a number of separatist movements in India. You know Nagaland has, had a, separ has a separatist movement, which wasn't there 50 years ago. But over the last 50 years, they converted to 90-some percent Christian, uh, the most Christian state in India, and a very aggressive uh, movement for separatism, which is supported by the Baptists in the United States. In fact, uh, one of the things mentioned in Billy Graham's uh, writing is regrets the inability to accomplish a separate, separate Nagaland state. This is a statement that he has made. Uh, so one can, if one looks at individual items like this, one can sort of dismiss them and say, well, this is something independent of whatever. But there's too many of these. And I don't use the word conspiracy. I know in the emotion of the talk that is Vinit's word. I, I say that there's a pattern. And whether it is intentional, whether there's a hand behind it, I do not know. I'm presenting the data that I'm sure of, and I'm happy to discuss that data. Um, so it's, a, it's the coming together of a number of these forces. They are not just Christian forces. They are also secular, uh, very uh, left-wing kind of forces that are doing this in the name of human rights. There are government in agencies. Uh, there, are, there are involvements of uh, U.S. federal government, European governments, and various such governments. And then there's a lot of individuals. So the thesis is not about whether or not a particular religion is good or not, but it is about what certain institutions are doing. And these institutions may or may not be acting in the best interest of that religion that they, are, they claim to be representing. So that's the sort of discussion that I would, uh, I would like to have. The, there are some myths that the book takes on directly. One of them is this myth of Aryan Dravidian divide, which has been promulgated since the 1800s uh, and, and, and by uh, British missionaries at the time. Both the Aryan theory and the, and the Dravidian theory emerged 
in a very big way. It suddenly came up in the discourse in the 1800s, uh, creating this divide of Indians into these two camps. And uh, I have a couple of uh, <coughs> recent blogs on Huffington Post. Uh, I won't go into the, all the theories for lack of time, but there are copies outside that people can help themselves with of this, how the Aryan theory came about, what was the agenda and the motive behind it, and how it's been refuted. And the other side of the coin is the Dravidian theory, which is alive, active, it is very mainstream, it is center, center of, uh, of politics in Tamil Nadu and in South India in general. And so how these theories have, uh, uh, have come about uh, is, is uh, a major critique or a major part of this book. And then a new kind of identity called Dravidian Christianity, which has been born more recently, uh, which claims that uh, th there is a link between uh, early Christianity coming to India and the rise of uh, the Tamil classics. The Tamil people are very proud of classics they have, which, uh, which actually are as old as Sanskrit and they predate uh, Christianity. But there is a fabrication of history to make them seem more recent so that they can be shown to be under the influence of St. Thomas or some Christian people. And this uh, Christianization of Dravidian identity is yet another myth. So the first, the Aryan myth, then the Dravidian myth, then the, Christian, uh, the Dravidian Christianity myth. And Dravidian Christianity is not just talking about the, uh, the uh, not just the changing the history of, uh, of uh, the Tamil classics. There's a huge amount of other things going on. There are some conferences we mentioned in this book which have happened in 2005 onwards almost every year, in fact, even before, where scholars are brought in as part of this worldwide project of Dravidian Christianity uh, in the under the rubric of uh, uh, rediscovering the history of religion in India. And there are papers after papers talking about uh, things like how the Bhagavad Gita actually came after Jesus, and it had some influences, and Krishna is actually a, a derivative of Christ, and uh, uh, Krishna's uh, profile in the Mahabharata was very violent. Uh, one very famous uh, uh, statement made by an academic scholar who was writing the 12th, 13th volume critical edition of uh, Mahabharata for the Western Academy, that the Mahabharata subtitle is uh, God's Genocide. That this is really a, a Krishna comes to commit genocide. And so then the idea of love is introduced to Jesus for the first time. And so G uh, Krishna's profile has to be softened up and he has to have love and so on. And then the bhakti starts and uh, uh, this idea of Gita is, is incorporated, interpolated later on into the Mahabharata. So there's, a, there's many, uh, uh, it, there are people who specialize in just one item and, th and those in another item. And to the casual uninformed person, they may seem unconnected. But then there's people who put it all together and make an overarching thesis out of it. So until this whole overarching thesis is understood, you don't know the significance of what somebody's work is when they're just trying to say, I'm changing the date of something to something else. So that's a huge part of the, of the, of the project. Now, human rights is a, is a very important program that I'm sure we share our views on human rights everywhere. Uh, human rights need to be better. Uh, human rights are a problem in India. There are underprivileged people. There is no denying that. Uh, their plight has to be upgraded. Uh, that is not uh, even a question. We are not sort of denying that or saying there is some kind of a perfect uh, nation or a perfect past or any of that stuff. Uh, the issue is on the methods being used. Uh, and, the, and, and the issue is not on the need for, for these methods. One of the prominent critics of uh, missionaries coming and converting as a way of uh, uh, upgrading their uh, lot was Mahatma Gandhi, in fact. And I have a handout, I have several handouts outside that you can just help yourself to. One of them is on Gandhi's writings about the missionaries. And there's, in fact, a book on Christian missionaries, their place in India by M.K. Gandhi. Uh, there's a book, and there's another one, uh, Gandhiji's Dialogue with Christianity. There's, a, there's, a no, there's quite a lot written by Gandhi himself, and he was, uh, he was a fierce fighter, debater on this issue. And basically, uh, he was saying that the same issues that he was raising are still there today, and they've even gotten worse. That in the pretext of uh, helping these people, uh, uh, you know, you're really trying to convert them. And in order to convert them, you have to demonize and denigrate their native tradition. And that, he felt, is not in the right spirit of Jesus' teachings. So he was not like, just like in my case, he was not knocking down Jesus. He was knocking down the missionaries who were using Jesus' name to do this kind of work. And Gandhi is not an easy person to dismiss. 
I mean, when he takes a stand like that, you cannot just sort of trivialize it and, and dismiss it. And so I would urge you, if you have an interest in this, you can, you can read up more on Gandhi's uh, debates with the missionaries. He even said once, if I had the power to legislate, I would abolish uh, Christian missionaries in India. It, it was his statement, very strong uh, statement he made. Now, another person uh, that is also quoted in something we're handing out uh, outside uh, is uh, B.R. Ambedkar. Uh, B.R. Ambedkar, for those of you who don't know, uh, was the person who coined the uh, for, uh, term Dalit, uh, oppressed. And uh, he was from that community himself, and he converted to become a Buddhist. He was considered the father of the Indian Constitution, or one of the authors, sort of like the figure of uh, Thomas Jefferson, or one of those great uh, thinkers, great intellectuals. And one of the uh, excerpts I have in the handout outside that you can read, said, gives an argument on why he thinks that the Dalits should not convert to Christianity or Islam. Regardless of what they're facing, he, he gives this very interesting <coughs> argument that this will break up the unity of India. And his argument is that these uh, religions are so institutionalized and so centrally managed, and the nexus, the headquarters of this management lies in a foreign country, that uh, if, you, if a sizable number of Indians were to convert to these, these uh, faiths, it would break up India because these uh, would, would, uh, would, would be subservient to the needs of the headquarters or they'd be fa they would be getting the directives from uh, the Western headquarters. So while he had all these problems that Dalits today have and he chose to convert, he argues, takes all the religious options and picks Buddhism because he says that it is the, it is the best option for, for an Indian to convert into who's, fa who's feeling that there's discrimination uh, because the other two are the options of uh, Christianity and Islam would cause uh, national harm, and, and he's quite strong about this. Now, the problems that the book talks about have to do with a whole phenomenon of uh, people who convert to Christianity for whatever reason. Uh, some may do it for actual faith, and others may do it because they got a better deal, and others may do it because they'll get, it, get into a management position they get some money, they get some foreign trips, they become part of the worldwide Western uh, you know, establishment and be media prominent, so they'll be, they'll be upgraded in their social status. Whatever the reason is, there is a gradual alienation from the native culture. Uh, there is a gradual distancing from the native, uh, uh, the, the indigenous culture. Uh, this is evident because you see in pockets where there's a larger, there's a sizable amount of uh, conversion that they begin to have their own cohesiveness, their own separateness of identity. And then this is fed by scholars and missionaries that you know your history is different, your, or your ancestors were different, and uh, you, are, you should change the language. So there's a whole uh, de-Indianization as a part of the, of the conversion process. This is something we are pointing out uh, in the book. And there's a very vicious, uh, demonology of the majority religion of India. A very vicious in the sense that I have videotapes from, for instance, there's an organization called Gospel for Asia in Texas that uh, is run by an Indian Christian. And in their literature, they talk about sending 30 to $35 million a year to South India every, you know, for, for their missions. And if you look at their videos, and I have a collection of them uh, with me, the, the, the talk about, you know, uh, Shiva is the devil, and uh, these guys are evil, and these people are heathens. I mean, it is just real aggressive demagoguery, and you cannot deny it. Uh, in fact, some of this is available on YouTube. You can go up and look at it. And also, the assault on Sanskrit uh, is troublesome. Uh, Sanskrit is sort of is a language in which a lot of things have been written, mathematics and astronomy and health, a lot of things have been written, and of course, religious discourse, but it's not only a religious uh, kind of language. So if it's sort of like, Somebody having a problem with, uh, you know, what uh, Romans might have done or what some ancient or early Christian uh, group might have done and therefore demonize Latin or something like that. Or, or you know, just demonize the whole Latin and the whole uh, uh, classics tradition uh, uh, on the basis that you don't like some particular part of what's written in it. And so this business of demonizing Sanskrit as something evil and demonic that uh, is, is also extremely tragic. And that is part of this, part of this uh, project. <coughs> now, the uh, results, the, while the church and 
non-church related secular foreign uh, intervention uh, have a right to uh, engage in uh, improving civil rights in India. Uh, the results are, which are not because of such forces, but because of the Indian government's own activities are very impressive. And this also, we have some literature there. If you look at 50 years ago and today, uh, the status of Dalits, how many were in parliament? How many were governors? How many were teachers? How many are policemen? How many are in certain you know, so social uh, situations, uh, of, of social, social status uh, positions? Uh, you will find an enormous uh, 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 you know, upgrading. And it will be interesting to compare that with uh, similar underprivileged people in other countries like Mexico or like Philippines or like uh, Venezuela, which are all Christian. I mean, if you really think that Christianity is going to solve the problem, then it, by now it would have solved the problem in all these other third world countries. But it hasn't. And, and the, 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 the progress that the uh, underprivileged in India have made, it, it doesn't mean that more progress is not necessary. But the gap between, between the upper strata and the lower strata in certain statistics uh, has uh, improved over the last 50 years. Uh, the overall uh, situation in education is bad for all strata because uh, a large percent of Indians uh, do not get primary education. But that is not caste biased or something like that. That is across the board. But the, per the, the second factor that has improved the plight of people, which has nothing to do with church intervention, is entrepreneurship. I mean, there's, there's a lot of Dalit billionaires. I was reading a list of these. The people who are actually now billionaires. There's a, uh, you know, there's a huge club of billionaires in India, and some of them are actually Dalits. So, um, the and the entrepreneurial character of these people is such that without necessarily some, you know, big brother taking care of them and looking after them, they have been able to move themselves up on their own. The book is very critical of uh, of certain uh, U.S.-based, particularly. Programs like there is a Joshua program out of Denver, which has identified the 10 degree and 40 degree latitude in which India is a big target as the target to convert and, and come up with a massive amount of funding and allocated it to a lot of uh, uh, you know groups in India to sort of carry out this. Then there are people like World Vision. We have a section on World Vision and their role. I mean, in some other countries, I, I'm not making the claim for India, but in some other countries in Latin America, they claim links with CIA to try and actually be a an arm of the government, of the US government, doing some under undercover operations. Then this global uh, this gospel for Asia I mentioned. Then Dalit Freedom Network. Now, an interesting thing is that when, when people th mention Dalit Freedom Network, uh, one would think that it's Dalits who initiated it and Dalits in charge of it. But when you really look behind who are the originators? It's people in the, in the United States, uh, non-Indian, non-Dalit, who are sometimes, many of them right-wing Christians, who organized a Dalit Freedom Network and put a bunch of uh, Dalits in front as the face. Uh, so some of the, uh, in, the Dalits have become very prominent and very popular as sort of leaders. But if you really look at the history and who's pulling the strings and who controls, and some of this data is available, those are not the Dalit people themselves. So those are, and then if you look at these right-wing Christians own background in their own country, in their own backyard, their voting records, there are some Republican congressmen in it and, and people of that sort, you will find that uh, it, it's a contradiction because <coughs> their own record on race and gender is hardly liberating. And yet they are trying to free some people in the other end of the world. So, they, so there is a kind of a, something artificial, something not quite right about these things. And then there is the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. There's a chapter which uh, critiques them also. And this is, was set up uh, with right wing pressure. It was signed into law by, uh, by Bill Clinton when he was president. And it holds hearings on atrocities uh, 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 which are, have to do with lack of religious freedom. Now, we've analyzed in this book every year's report as it pertains to India. And it's, um, it's amazing that the Hindus are always the culprit. And somebody else, some generally Christians are sort of the victims. And it, it, it would, a person reading would think that this is a one-sided situation with a huge amount of persecution going on. But that is literally not the case. And, in, and we pointed out some blatant errors they've made and the kind of witnesses they've relied upon who the courts of India have dismissed and some of the 
testimony that they've given has been proven false. So there's a big pipeline from what's the collection of such things in India and all the way to places like Washington and Brussels and London and various media outlets uh, and, and how to kind of really rabble rouse an image that you know there's some horrible things going on. And the US Commission has uh, in some years listed India on the same level of uh, uh, lack of religious freedom as uh, North Korea, Saudi Arabia, they've listed India in that category <laughs> as a country. Now people who live in India laugh at this because I think it, the, 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 the last thing you would accuse the Indian society is lack of religious freedom because the freedom to pursue your own religion is one of the, one of the very deeply rooted things. But there is this huge propaganda machinery. And we also have a chapter on the Christian media, uh, which is, there are, world, there are global networks, media networks, and then they meet, they have annual meetings here and there, and they, they champion people in various countries to supply uh, news that will feed this kind of uh, mentality, this kind of victimhood, martyrdom, victimhood, this sort of mentality. And you know, they give awards, they, give, uh, they, give, uh, they recognize the, the, the people in, in India who feed this sort of stuff, atrocity literature, we call it. So there's a chapter which talks about how that machinery works, who are some of the major players in it, uh, uh, and so on. Now, the uh, challenges that I'm raising, I'm, I'm uh, raising for uh, a people who are interested in, uh, in, in where are we going with this. I'm raising a few challenges. First, the challenge I'm raising is we need to question who's a minority in, in India. If a minority group becomes more, of, more or less a subsidiary of a foreign enterprise, then it's not a minority. It's a foreign branch office. And the analogy I give is that if you see a McDonald's restaurant somewhere in India, and there's only 20 employees, you're not going to say this is a minority establishment because it's small scale business, 20 employees. You know that it's a branch office of a multi, multi, multinational. If you see a small Coca-Cola uh, uh, you know, retail shop, you know that Coca-Cola operation is not a minority, it is part of a global Coca-Cola brand. So it should be the same criteria if uh, I I supposedly there was a minority and there has been a minority, but they are now governed by, the, the criteria is whether they're governed by a nexus overseas, whether their funding comes from a headquarters overseas, whether their ideology, whether their management and leadership training comes from overseas, whether they look up to some boss overseas for recognition because he makes them famous, whether this overseas headquarters gives them the legitimacy, the politics, the media, uh, you know, c coverage, the public relations. If all these are true, or if uh, several of them are true, then under corporate law, this would be considered a controlled foreign corporation. If, if the same thing happened to a private company, it would be considered a subsidiary or a branch office of a foreign enterprise. So if you apply the same criteria, some of the, some of the outfits in India should not be qualified as minorities. So this is a challenge that I'm posing. I'm not saying all of them are like that. I'm sure, I know that there are many very good ones, very legitimate ones that are doing excellent work, that are very autonomous, that are not getting their, their marching orders from somewhere else, that are following uh, you know, their own conscience and their own <coughs> idea of, uh, of the faith uh, and not, uh, not uh, in a subservient to a foreign master. But then I'm, we are, our book is talking about the ones which are actually doing this. So you have these kind of things like India is a Christian nation. Uh, this is a, a book that is selling a lot uh, among these groups in India. There's a very powerful guy called Kancha Ilaya, and he's uh, written this book, Post Hindu India. Now this is, for you to understand, uh, it's not the same thing as, you know, uh, American and Christian are self-critical. So what's wrong? It's not the same thing, because this is, a 2% minority or 3% minority in India, heavily funded from uh, another part of the world to be producing these things. A better analogy would be if there's a 2-3% minority in the United States, say Muslims or Hindus or anybody like that, uh, who is under the control of some foreign, foreign location and they all are loyal to that foreign location. That is their primary location. And they are here writing, you know, post-Christian America and getting awards for it. And these are, th these are not marginal books. These are books that, you know, written by people who come to University of Chicago and they come to all the Ivy League once a year and they give talks and they're given awards. So these are not on the margins. They're very much endorsed by the mainstream. So if, if you had 
that kind of a syndrome, then it would certainly be okay for someone to write a book critiquing it. And that's all I'm doing. I, I have no authority or intention or capability to stop in any of this, but I certainly have the right to write a book on it. You know, at least, at least start the, the conversation. And the thing that I told you about Christian control media is there's a book by a Christian, an Indian Christian, uh, uh, Thomas. Uh, and, and he's writing on strong religion, zealous media, Christian fundamentalism and communication in India. That's his book. And he's, he's explaining how this mechanism works, uh, who controls it, what are the institutional apparatus, and what is at stake, and are they doing a good job or a bad job, and how over the last five, 10 years they've taken control of television and this and that and that, and various training academies where they're training, uh, training journalists to uh, speak a certain ideology. So this is being written about in pieces here and there, and a large part of what we've done is compile, compile that kind of information. The second um, uh, thing I want to uh, provoke you on is the, the Christians that I know in the United States, I know a lot of liberal Christians, and, and their idea of Christianity is very different from the, I, the kind of Christianity I see being spread in India in some places. Because the kind of Christianity I see the liberals in this country having is very Hindu oriented. I mean, the, the Christians here, the liberal Christian here is maybe a vegetarian, they believe in animal rights, uh, maybe doing yoga, maybe doing some meditation, uh, you know, maybe they want to worship the divine in a feminine form, uh, they don't believe in institutions necessarily, and uh, it, you know, it's, they have a direct link with the divine. The, all these are very Hindu ideas. But the question is, if such ideas of Christianity were being marketed in India, it would not sell because the audience would say, we already got it. You got <laughs> nothing to say. I mean, you, you, you go back and give something better, come back with a better mousetrap because we already got it. And maybe you are saying all this because you learned it from us. So to create a, a distance between Christianity, a superiority for Christianity vis-a-vis -vis the native tradition, the kind of Christianity being taught sometimes is very radical, very literalist, uh, very much into, very taboo-oriented, things that maybe medieval Christianity, some of, the, some of the evangelicals are teaching more like medieval Christianity, which liberal Christians have themselves left behind. But this is something that the, the average Christian in this country that I come across is unaware of. When they're writing a check to send you know, $30 a month to some orphanage somewhere, they're unaware of the type of Christianity is not necessarily that w the kind that they would espouse for themselves. So the Christian uh, church in India has not been put on the spotlight uh, for corruption, uh, there's a, there's a, this is acknowledged, uh, but it is it is be, the Indian media is too scared because uh, politically it's not politically correct you know, to do all that to talk about it. There are sex scandals like there are here. There are sex scandals there. Now there are sex scandals in every religion. There's a lot of Hindu swamis who get in trouble, but that's fair game for the media to rabble rouse and to get a lot of uh, attention on that. But Christian uh, sex scandals are covered up. The media generally won't talk too much about it. And the, uh, the, the environment that has been created is for some middlemen to thrive. And these middlemen have to prove to their superiors in the West that they're doing a real good job of conversion. They have to sub produce numbers. It's like corporate. Back in my corporate days, you have to produce numbers. <laughs> because somebody wants a spreadsheet saying, OK, what's your cost per convert? And th there is a cost per conversion ratio that you got to produce. And so uh, and these statistics are published. So they are into a kind of a marketing, production, expansionist mode, quantitative rather than the quality of Jesus, which is what I would like to see, that they try and imbibe the quality, the superior qualities of Jesus as a role model. And that's not what the program seems to be about. It seems to be more about numerical expansion. So in this drive, a certain tier of uh, uh, Indian Christian have become very powerful. And for them, it is their livelihood, it is their power structure, their prestige, and they are jet-setting, world-traveling, living the good life. They're hardly the poor people that they are trying to serve. They're really upper strata. And there's a name for them called the creamy layer. I mean, that's the Indian courts that use the term that there is a creamy layer among these people. And a lot of the uh, money and <coughs> funds and so on that are allocated to the underprivileged end up with, with just a few of them. I will conclude by saying that, because I think we want to uh, move on, so I, what I will, the final point I make is that um, <coughs> the book also talks about the, it, it's not a book on the religious dimensions of this, but more on the geopolitics of US-India relations. Uh, and 
what I just told you about is a piece of the geopolitical relations between US and India. On the one hand, India is considered one of the greatest friends and allies of the United States recently. But why are these other things happening is, is the issue. Uh, these, the, the, uh, during the Cold War, when India was on the Soviet side, uh, the CIA had programs to subvert, and uh, the, the support for Dravidian movement and Anna Durai, well documented <coughs> from US, because the idea of keeping India divided was a good option. But now India is a friend, and yet nothing has been done to dismantle these old programs. In fact, the, in the name of globalization, the church has become very aggressive uh, and, and started, uh, started a huge uh, campaign to buy land in India, which is very scarce. And when you own land, you can leverage it economically and create jobs and so on, and use that to convert people. So through owning land, uh, owning the schools and educational facilities and hospitals, certain churches, not all, uh, and I must say, in my conversations uh, with uh, Reverend Thompson, I was very happy to hear that his church does not believe in conversion, that he, they believe in philanthropy for its own sake, human being to human being, and I was extremely happy to hear that. But that's not the kind of thing we're criticizing. What we're criticizing is the, is the syndrome where the two are linked, that there is a, either a direct conversion or an indirect conversion somewhere along the way. So the question I'm asking, I, uh, the provocation I'm offering to the US foreign policymakers is that they need to rethink support for Christianity overseas. But this is not an India only thing. I have a whole pile of books in my house, I just brought a few of them here, on the export of the gospel, the export of the uh, Christian gospel as a part of US foreign policy since the early 1900s. In First World War, Second World War, Vietnam, Korean War, uh, in these Middle East fights, you know, in Afghanistan, Iraq, everywhere. Uh, and in all of those instances, the church has a very aggressive foreign policy on what they want the government to do. And they are tightly involved, whether it's Republicans or Democrats makes no difference, they're involved. Uh, since Obama took office, many of us hoped that the US Commission on International Religious Freedom would diversify. But tragically, the old appointees are still there. The, he hasn't changed those appointments. And here is a commission whose purpose is to look for human rights violations all over the world, uh, you know, and should be doing it for all the traditions. But there's not a single member from the Dharma tradition. There's not a single Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh on the commission. And they're all from, they're, they're, they're no, in the US commission. There was uh, Pritha Bansi, but she left. She left because of reasons, okay? Because she couldn't get, uh, you know, we, we can talk about it. But I know Pritha, and she, le she was there, and she left. And this happened a couple of years ago, she left. So uh, <coughs> not only is it, Christian dominated, but the kind of Christians that are very right wing. I mean, they are the ones who wanted this uh, uh, thing set up in the first place and they put their people in. So a lot of world vision type of people are running the show. And this is, they are not people without a conflict of interest. They have a conflict of interest because they have a marketing campaign in those countries. And they are the watchdogs for the US Congress telling the US Congress, you know, what, what is going on, supposedly in an objective manner, but this could hardly be called objective. So that's the message for policymakers. The second message I have is for Christian, liberal Christians in this country who sponsor, support, donate to such causes in the third world. And my request is that you should look at the conversion angle. You should ask, you should have somebody do due diligence on how much of this money is going for conversion and, and uh, whether the type of Christianity being marketed fits your idea of Christianity. Is it what you as a Christian really believe? Or is it that some what something is being made up because it is set? And also the third, the fin final message I have is for NGOs who are doing excellent work, but some of them without knowing it get get stuck in similar uh, vortexes. Uh, they they may not know that uh, some of the affiliations, some of the projects they're involved with, are with partners who are involved in this type of project, which I'm calling 